Hi, everybody. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Judith Orloff, MD, psychiatrist, empath, New York Times bestseller of the Empath's Survival Guide, and also thriving as an empath. And what I love about Judith is that she brings together both the logical side of medicine, traditional medicine, of which she's got many, many years of training and experience, along with empathy, energy, spirituality. So I feel very fortunate to have you here today, Judith. And um, just would love you to uh, maybe share what's uppermost with you right now. Uh, well, I'm so happy to, to be with you and I'm happy to meet everyone who is viewing this. Um, very thrilled to meet you. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about myself and my background and my interest in empaths and sensitive people. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm an MD. I've had 14 years of medical training. I went to USC uh, Medical School. I did my internship at Wadsworth VA Hospital in California, and I did my residency at UCLA Hospital. So I've had a lot of various trainings from county hospitals to private hospitals. I've had a lot of experience with people and interviewing people and listening to patients' stories. That's always been my biggest attraction to medicine is listening to patients' stories and the truth, you know, the raw truth of what people go through in their lives. And so I listen both with my analytic mind and with my empath abilities. So being an empath is somebody who is intuitive and open and very sensitive and very heartfelt, but doesn't have the same filters that other people have. So we tend to become emotional sponges and take on the, the angst of the world or the suffering of the stranger. And wherever they're suffering, the empath automatically wants to take it in. And that isn't a good thing. So in the empath survival guide and in the, the online course, I'm gonna be talking about how not to take on other people's emotions or physical pain and still hold a compassionate, loving space for somebody. That's yes. Empath 101, learning how to observe, not absorb. Yes. Very important. And so it's something that I have to practice every day. I don't always succeed. Uh, sometimes, you know, it just sneaks in. I'm not as grounded or as, as um, protected as I would like to be. Um, and then at those times, you know, empaths can get sensory overload when too much is coming at them too fast. And so what you do then, and what I do is just close the door, go into a quiet room you know, as soon as you possibly can, when you notice you're, you're starting to flutter and go on sensory overload and just be quiet. The silence is an empath's friend. Just be yes. quiet. And it yes. might take a while to land back in your body but you want to catch sensory overload as soon as possible so it doesn't turn into an anxiety attack yes. or depression or uh, an angry outburst. It can just ha you know result in all kinds of things that won't be positive for your life. Mm -hmm. So you want to be aware of the beautiful aspects of being an empath and also some of the challenges of being an empath that you know it requires discernment and mindfulness and listening to your body and not just being a disembodied head, you can't possibly do that and be an empath. You have to attend to what's going on in the body. So, you know, that that's, and I have a, a private practice and I, I see Zoom clients all around the world um, who are highly sensitive and want to develop their empath abilities. A lot of creatives, a lot of artists, a lot of healthcare practitioners or any anybody, any age, um, you know, I, I've started treating people in their 90s who've awakened as empaths in their 90s. I mean, how awesome is that? It just makes me so happy. So whenever your time is to find out about this, let's say you're listening to me and go, I really relate to that. Take the 20 question self-assessment test in the beginning of the book and see how much of an empath you are. 
because if you are an empath, even a slight empath, you need to know about it. And you need to know what are your strengths, what are your challenges, and set out to work with all of that and come into your power, which is the ultimate goal. Yes, yes. Thank you, Judith. Yes. When I did your test, I, I ticked 19 out of the 20. So it was like, oh, all right. <laughs> because I've always felt a little bit like an alien on this planet. Like, what am I doing here? It's so... Oh everything affects i find that i'm so affected by little things you see so and i i imagine that you are probably similar in that regard very very similar that's why i love you can see my background you see the the i'm in southern california so you see the palm trees and the way the light moves and the little rainbows that come through so i create an environment as an empath that's very soothing to me yeah. And because I'm sensitive to the everything. I mean, empaths are very sensitive to light. And if you notice all the light in the background and see the rainbows, it's just the way I've created the space because that's important to me. And empaths need to have a, you know, a, a supportive, aesthetically pleasing space if you can. I mean, even if you live in a one in one room somewhere, you could make that space clean and and heart centered and beautiful a beautiful color on one wall or something to make you happy yeah you know that's empaths are very sensitive that way and i can see from your background <laughs> that's how you feel comfortable <laughs> well i just you know try with different things and i'm very sensitive to noise as well sounds this and and as you say if you let it build up once it builds up it becomes so unpleasant and it takes such a long time to diffuse it. Yes, it does. And it, it takes a shorter time, the quicker you can catch it. Yeah. See what happens yeah. mostly with empaths is they're either not aware that it's building up or they just try and tolerate it, that it's building up. And that's, that's a mistake. Um, even if it means taking a break from your business meeting and going to the bathroom and sitting in the bathroom, and closing your eyes, putting your hand on your heart, breathing and quieting yourself down, yes. calming yourself, self-soothing. When everything starts to get too high, you have to learn how to tune into that in yourself. When the stimulation level gets too high, you have to recognize it early on. Otherwise, it, it could take a weekend. Sometimes, you know, if it's really bad, it could take a weekend or longer for me to come back and you know, that's, so that's okay, but you know, I'd rather not have it go that, that long. So I just suggest if, if you can train yourself to, to check it out and, and don't in yourself and don't over schedule yourself. That is the worst possible thing an empath can do. And I've learned it so many times, you know, and I, I've gotten it, you know, I still err on that, that, you know, it takes, <laughs> it's a learning curve. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Isn't it ever? Yes. <laughs> but yes, that's a wonderful point. Don't over schedule yourself because once you start rushing and running around, then you come out of the body. It's like you're dismembered. <laughs> and, and that's right. That's what happens. You disassociate from your body and you gravitate up to your head. So you're just a thinking organism and that's not going to be nurturing. An empath is very body oriented. Very. And I think we're trained, well, particularly I was brought up in England, we're trained to have a stiff upper lip, you know, and not to not to express, <laughs> and not to feel. So. Absolutely. And, and, you know, here in the US, especially boys are called sissies and crybabies and, you know, cowards and all kinds of horrible bullying kinds of comments, which are just unacceptable. But yeah. it, it's, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, how threatened people are, how they have a lack of education about the power of sensitivity. And it's, it's a kind of, a, I think, look at it, it's kind of a neurodiversity. You know, I think we're wired differently. I think empaths are wired differently than people who don't have the empathic abilities. And I'm not saying we're better than or less than, I'm just saying that we have our special gifts. And you have to realize that you are a little bit different from the person who 
can go by an ambulance and it doesn't affect them. The sound of that loud oh. iron that goes, I know, or you're, oh. And like the other person is just like forging ahead. They don't perceive oh. it the same way, which is fine, but you do. And the damage that I've seen happen to empaths is people will say, you're overly sensitive. You need to toughen up. Yes. You need to change. That's what my parents said to me when I was a child. And it made me feel like I was, there was something wrong with me. Yes. I was ashamed of my abilities. And my parents loved me. They weren't abusive parents or anything. Mm -hmm. They yeah. loved me. And they just thought for my well-being, I should toughen up. That it's not a good thing to, to be sensitive. And that's not, by the way, that's not the proper thing to say to an empathic child. You want to help them work with their sensitivities. And learn how to calm themselves and center themselves and honor the great gift of their intuition. You don't want to tell them, just don't be you. That's generally not a good message to a child. So No, no, it's certainly not. And thank goodness for your work and what you're doing now, because I think more and more people are coming out, if you like, as empaths, as super sensitive people. And now that many of us have been locked up for the last couple of years, even right. more now with fears and anxieties and emotions that have not been faced, maybe for even lifetimes, are now having to be addressed. And that's where I feel your work is such a tremendous gift, Judith. Yeah, I mean, and you're, you're even offering a, a seven-week online course that starts on Monday, the 31st of January, January 31st, as you say, in America, and it's called Awakening to Your Intuitive Healing Power. It's going to be seven weeks of, of really um, tuning in to the power of your emotions and in order to heal and transform your fear and your pains and your anxieties. And maybe you'd like to share a little more about that, uh, Judith, because I really feel sure. what we're doing is now needed. Oh, I would because empaths and it's a, it's a course, especially for empath sensitives and intuitives, um, because those you know uh, uh, we we're sensitive souls and we're very sensitive to emotions and have to learn how not to be overwhelmed by our emotions. It's just we have to learn how to work with the energy of the emotions and. What's so great about this course is that each week we'll deal specifically with only one emotion and I'll go through the details of how to work with it as an empath, how to work with fear, one week is fear, how to work with uh, frustration and transform it into patience, you know, how to work with anger and transform it with calm. So we'll have the luxury of time to really dive deep into each emotion, which is so great. And then I'll give you specific assignments to work with. And you'll see areas maybe that are obstacles for you. You know, maybe your father was a rageaholic. So you tend to get angry with your children or your mate. And you, you need to cut the bonds, you know, with the father's anger. So there's specific techniques we'll, we'll go through. Because what I found as an empath, and we'll talk about this in the course, is that we sometimes have taken on the pain or the emotional stress of our parents being an empathic child. I know my mother had a lot of, a lot of physical problems and she, you know, she would ask me to sit with her on her bedside and hold her hand when she had chest pain and she would close the, the, the uh, curtains very dark and it was stuffy and horrible and scary. And I was this little girl. I shouldn't have been there. I was too young to be there, you know, but nobody rescued me. I was, Nobody came and said, no, honey, I'll do this. So I was sitting there with the mother I loved so much. I was an only child holding her hand when she was in pain. So as an empath, of course, I absorbed that. And I absorbed the anxiety she was feeling. And so as, my, as I came to understand that as an adult and as an empowered empath, I learned how to work with what's hers and what's mine because I took on a lot of hers and empaths you know, in the course, we'll learn how to differentiate. What have you taken on from your parents or loved ones or mates or children that is not yours? You know, what? how can you lovingly detach from that and just work? You've got enough to work with on your own, let alone taking on everybody else's stuff. Gosh. And I want to say that it doesn't help 
to take on other people's emotions or pain, though it's an instinct with empaths. So I want to point that out. It is an instinct. We instantly go there to want to take it away, but it doesn't work because all you get are two people suffering it. Yeah, exactly. But um, I'd love to learn more about how to differentiate between what is actually yours and what you've absorbed. Like you, I'm, I had a mother, she didn't have so much physical problems, but she came out of the, um, on the kinder transport from uh, Austria. And um, I can remember as a five-year-old child, she would be crying in the kitchen and telling me everything that had happened to her as a child. And I was like five, six years old. Um, wanting to help and not really knowing and just crying with her so i can really of course, of course you're i mean it's there's so many of us who are in situations like that maybe people who are listening can yes. think back to your childhood and say you know was i as a young child put in a situation i shouldn't have been in was i too young to yes. have to deal with this you should be reading and playing and going outside and climbing trees you, <laughs> you shouldn't be with your mother in pain i'm sorry you know, I, I'm all for a real childhood for children, yes. but it's not realistic because so many of us got put in those positions. And so I tell you the story just to maybe invite you to look back in your past and see what I put in that position and how much did I take on? How much do I still take on from my loved ones? And the, the course is about how not to do that and wow. still be more loving than ever. All right, easy. So oh, it's, it's wonderful. Set. Yeah, it's a skill set that, that most empaths don't know how to no. learn. No, people don't know where to start. Yeah, you, you, you've, you've, you've taken in all this over a lifetime and you've practiced it very hard and very well. And how do you undo it? How do you unravel it? And um, you've got some of the keys and the tools, I believe, that you're ready to share so that yes, yes and also this this book here um the empath survival guide i hope you can see it there's a lot of yes. light here where i'm at right you can see it perfectly yes okay okay if i see all i'm seeing is light and rainbows <laughs> <laughs> but that's good that you can see it but this is the the first book the foundational book the empath survival Rainbow. guide and then the next book which i'm not going to hold up is uh thriving as an empath which is the companion book. And it, it's a day at a time book, January 1st, January 2nd, January 3rd, through the whole year. And each day is a different self-care technique for empath. Okay. So it, it'll take you through your year. And it's one of my favorite books I've ever written. I put so much of my heart into it. Um, I hope you're noticing all the beautiful shadows in the background. Just beautiful, but seeing your beautiful face with all the light, you know, it's just very beautiful, really. You look it lovely. is watching it yes. too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we will be posting all the links to all of Judith's books and this online course because I do think this is something special and very cutting edge. Yes, it's like what we need now are tools that we can really use. And there's not many people out there right now. In fact, to me, you're unique in this field in being able to help people with um, living an open, authentic life as an empath and able to enjoy your life instead of having to hide and make excuses. And, you know, uh, even if I see a doctor, for example, if I see a medical professional, I have to tell him right at the start, look, you have to give me a child's dose. You have to go, you know, it's like, and I have to train them as to what I'm, what I'm like. And I know very quickly if the, somebody's telling me, oh, you're, you're not that sensitive. Don't be ridiculous. And I'm like, right. Whoa. Right. that's how most of them are. Yes, sadly. So, so it's, they, they think a child's dose won't work and sometimes it won't, but sometimes it will. And I know with all my empath patients, I don't give out much medication, but whenever I do, I start with a teeny tiny dose to see how they respond. They're, I always listen to how their bodies are responding to it. And yes. that's so key. Um, it's, if you take a medication, it's meant to help you. So if it's not helping you, it's not, you probably don't need to take it. 
um, but with some exceptions. Um, but it needs it needs to help you. You need to be on something. And the child's dose or taking a sliver of, um, you know, sometimes you know, I, I very rarely, but sometimes I'll put my patients on uh, antidepressants. You know, just to balance their biochemistry for a short time. But I give them the sliver of the amount. And traditional medicine says it won't work, but I'm telling you, it works. And it's not just the placebo effect. I mean, I'd be fine if it was, but it isn't. It's it's the, the medication actually works. Empath systems are so sensitive, they don't need as much of anything. You know, like it, it's been shown, you know, neurologically that we have, uh, we need less dopamine than non-empaths. Uh, and dopamine is the pleasure hormone. And so we'll get pleasure from sitting and reading a book or walking by the beach or um, just looking outside of the clouds, um, playing with our dogs, our little kitties, our animal friends, you know, that we get happy, but, but yeah. people who are non-empaths maybe need to go to a Rolling Stones concert to get their, their jolt of dopamine. And we don't need that. We get we get our dopamine just fine in, in smaller things. So yeah. just for you to realize that biochemical difference between you and a non-empath. Wow, that is really fascinating. I didn't know that there was a an actual biology about it. So um, that's what's great is that you're bringing the science there, so that we begin to have a bit of proof rather than feeling what with these weirdos like a weird person who's just you know sensitive to everything but as you say i was watching the snow falling i was just mesmerized with it <laughs> exactly and perhaps perhaps the non-empath wouldn't be looking at it for five or ten minutes you know no. we i say i love looking out at nature so i can look at it for a really long time because it's just so mesmerizing and and to maybe the non-empath or the intellectual, they go, oh, that's pretty. And then they go on to the next thing. Yes. Whereas we're vibing with, <laughs> we're, we're like communing with the life force, you know, yes. and the, the non-empath doesn't necessarily do that. So, you know, yes. again, it's not better or worse. It's just no. to find your own people who also do it. So you don't feel like you're strange or weird. It's not strange or weird. I actually think it's a form of evolution. Um, yes, but, um, yes, um, with you on that, absolutely. Of course, because how are we going to become a new earth that we are hopefully evolving into? How are we going to raise the consciousness unless we begin to develop new biology, maybe, to be able to connect with the diversity that we have, the beauty of the diversity, but to be able to really feel one another, to be able to create something that is peaceful and without war, without pain, which is, I think, what ultimately we're, we're hopefully working towards. And this... Empaths couldn't bear a warlike state. It would be too painful. Mm -hmm. Empaths would never go there. That isn't where they go. <laughs> they retreat. Yeah. They don't... To, to spare themselves. They don't go to wartime. Those are not, I, I have, you know, known police officers and uh, the military, empaths in the military, but it's been very hard for them, you know, very, I mean, you can imagine, especially in active combat, my God, but empaths don't naturally gravitate towards making war. That isn't what they like doing. <laughs> No, <laughs> definitely not. And um, as an empath, it, what is I find quite difficult is if I have to go shopping or I'm in a mall or an airport or a busy train station, I, I kind of almost freeze. Um, what are your tips for dealing with that? Or could you recommend any, any kind of strategy for handling that? Well, a mistake that my patients make who are empaths, who are opening up to their empathic abilities is they get to read people. They can feel people's energy. They can open up to this. They can read them. But the shopping center is not the place to do it or the mall. It's a formula for defeat. 
you'll be overwhelmed because every person walking around has energy coming from them. So thus, if we go to a shopping mall, if empaths go to a shopping mall, or you know, even a market, you know, especially with, with what's going on with COVID and the increased hostility and, and fear in the air. So it's even harder than it ever was. Yes. Um, you don't want to read people. You don't want to tune into their energy. You want to stay in your bubble. There's a technique of putting yourself in a bubble or even taking your fingers and just drawing a circle around your body. It's an old uh, Gallic technique. Take the fingers and put it put a circle around the body of protection. It's very simple. You can feel your fingers lighting up when you do it. Beautiful. And it, it protects you from what's around you so you can do your business, stay in your own lane and get out, in and out, a functional task. You don't wanna be tuning in or getting involved with what's going on with people mm -hmm. because so you know, I mean, each person has a tremendous amount of suffering they give off as part of their humanity. And it's just something you've come to accept if you get used to reading people and you don't get involved with it. You go namaste, you know, good luck with it. But you don't get involved. And empaths need to know what's their business and what's none of their business. They have, they have to know this, you know. And most of it's none of your business, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, Judith. You're right. It's just that it's a learning curve. You know, it's like, oh dear, I overstepped the mark again. And, That's uh, fine then to be compassionate over and over and over again with yourself and to say okay Annie you did it again that's fine live and learn you know it sometimes takes a while to learn things you know it really does so I hope you all can be compassionate with yourself if you make mistakes or you fall back or whatever you do you know it's about it's all about compassion and if you're an empath at this time in history, it's a very special role to play. Yes. And you want to um, become as empowered as possible with your empath abilities and deal with some of the challenges that we're talking about. And take some active steps to be conscious about this. You can't just let it go. It, yes. It's a part, it's, it's embracing your sensitivities. And maybe that's painful because, you know, people have been punished in early childhood for their sensitivities. You know, they've been shamed, they've been punished, um, all kinds of horrible things. You know, in the past, if you believe in past lives, you know, they've been burned at the stake as witches, all the seers and the women who have been squashed. I mean, there is a big history, energetic history that, that can scare you if you can tune into it, but you don't want to let it. As I know when I first started going public with all this and speaking, I had a lot of fear about it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of fear I would be hurt in some way. And then I got, no, not this time. You know, no, it's safe now for you to do this. Now is the time to do this. So I got a really strong message about that. And don't be afraid, no one's gonna shoot you, you know, or whatever the fear was, because if you look, look at empaths and their sensitivities and you look at their sensitivities to the here and now and also, to the collective and their ancestors and what's happened to women, all of the women who have the, the genetic collective memory of being squashed and the seers being, you know, all kinds of horrible things have happened to them. And I think everybody I know who is an empath, you know, it's not just you, something horrible happened in the past. It's like to most of us, say so it's not, you're not alone. So, but it's just what happened and it's not happening now to a much lesser degree. You know, so I, I'm feeling really good about coming out and having a voice about being a seer and being an empath right now and helping yes. you empower yes. yourself and begin the, the healing process. You know, if, if you've been hurt, you know, I'm sorry if you've been hurt, you know, and this is a, a statement I just want to make for everyone who's ever hurt you and can't apologize to you, you know, I will apologize for them. No, I'm sorry you were hurt. I'm sorry you were not understood. And I hope you come to love yourself now and feel loved and cherished by yourself and others. So it's a, it's a big apology for everybody who didn't know better or couldn't 
apologize or all the lost souls who inflict suffering on others. So anyways, I hope you can accept my apology for them. Because I know sometimes that makes people cry when I say yeah. that. Brought a tear to my eye. Yeah. It did. And I've been Of course. Well, yeah. That's really, yeah. Really so beautiful. We've all been together. Like what you said about feeling an alien on Earth. Empaths often feel like an alien on Earth. I used to climb up on my roof and wait for the spaceship to come and land and take me to my true home when I was a child. That's, you know, the same sentiment that you expressed. Totally, totally. What am I doing here? But now, as you say, it, there is hope now because it's, it's time and there's no more hiding. There's no more time to hide and scuttle away. Your gifts as an empath, whoever's listening now, are needed now more than ever more than ever in every single field from medicine to the arts to farming and our food and our nutrition everything we need you we need you to wake up and that's why i'm just so grateful you graciously accepted my invitation to to come and be with us today and um i'm conscious that you had a time uh, schedule so I would like to respect that and um, just welcome everybody please to check out Dr. Judith Orloff uh, com. please check out her website her books we've got all the links in the description box I'll be sending it out in my newsletter we'll make sure that this is uh, promoted everywhere Judith thank you oh well, wonderful and I, I thank everyone for for listening and I send my love out to all of you and, and honor your sensitivities don't let anyone shame them you know you're not alone we're all here together yeah. wow. thank you so much Judith it's been a great great pleasure being with you thank you